So in Glacier National Park, uh, there has been something going on recently. If officials have uh, removed signs and other features uh, claiming that, according to climate projections, all the glaciers at Glacier National Park would be gone by 2020 or in some cases 2030. Um, so the development, so these projections have been based from uh, on climate modeling uh, in the early 2000s for this for this locality in the Rocky Mountains, uh, where there was sort of a rapid melting period for some years. But now, since about 10 years ago, uh, the most prominent glaciers have been growing, and some significantly so. So this will not actually happen with the deadline 2020 and, and unlikely with 2030. So the overall context, of course, is, yeah, global warming, uh, retreating glaciers globally, uh, and then, of course, Glacier National Park will be the monument without any glaciers in it. That's, that's at least the narrative. And the uh, United States Geological Survey uh, has said that, yeah, they expect that the glaciers will be gone probably somewhere between 2030 and 2080 in that area. Um, but of course, I noticed this pattern um, where you get a lot of coverage when people make big pronouncements and, and putting signs there saying, yeah, you know, just a couple of years and all these glaciers at Glacier National Park will be gone. And then when they remove the signs, because this prediction didn't happen, uh, the media is just you know, silent, not reporting it that much. It's not that big a deal. It's just, you know, a failed prediction. Uh, but this is sort of a government messaging disaster because uh, so these uh, like Glacier National Park museums and so on, they, they are supposed to be educational. So you send off your high school kids there, you know, to, to watch this uh, natural beauty and, and what happens to it and, you know, the educational part will then tell them, oh, we are actually destroying that right now with human CO2 emissions. And so this, of course, was jumped on. And then later, it's never retracted. And this pattern we've seen in climate change, uh, definitely, but also in other areas. So some short-term trend is uh, sort of projected into the future. And then we say, oh, yeah, we will have like crazy sea level rise in Miami, or we will have, you know, crazy storms and tornadoes. Uh, recently, uh, some Democratic uh, presidential candidates uh, try to jump on the tornado search in, in recent weeks. And of course, then uh, some of the experts had to had to paddle this back a little and said, well, we don't really have a connection. The science doesn't say that tornadoes will get stronger or more intense. We can't connect that to, to global warming, but maybe it is uh, connected. We don't, we just don't know. It just means we don't know it. So it's a, it's a one, it's a, it's a one sided narrative all the time. And we've seen this before, uh, particularly with uh, something like the population bomb, very popular in the 1970s. And people like Paul Ehrlich um, proclaimed that, oh yeah, there we will see in 10 years, you know, starting in the 1970s, uh, major famines because people cannot feed themselves. Uh, and India, places like India, pe people will starve to death and, and so on. And of course, the exact opposite happened. And Paul Ehrlich never uh, apologized, to my knowledge, and never tracked that back. He's now claiming, oh, we just postponed the doomsday a little bit. We will get, we will see that in, a, in the next couple of decades. Uh, and he doesn't ever acknowledge that his projection was based on a total misunderstanding of resources and and how things work in and then of course the agricultural revolution came with better fertilizers and better pesticides and better understanding of genetic patterns in crop plants and so on so we it's just that it's he wasn't off by a bit he just predicted the exact opposite of what happened and something similar happened in general resource depletion scares, you know, the Club of Rome made predictions and actually had mathematical models to predict about what time we would run out of, you know, tin and copper and oil and so on. And so, again, the exact opposite happened, of course, and that was fundamentally based on their 
bad methodology in predicting the future. And this is never, never, ever acknowledged. And these uh, failures are often never known to the public. So I, I'm seeing today politicians proclaiming, yeah, the Club of Rome was fundamentally right. They, you know, they couldn't really know what we know today, but we know in a couple of decades we will run out of, of certain commodities, right? And so this is, I find this really, it's, to many people it's amusing. I find this horrific because with so many historical facts and events, we don't recollect. So we, we should we should primarily, I think, focus on highlighting what experts predicted 30 years ago and what actually happened, instead of just saying, oh, what, what are the best experts saying now about the pattern in 30 years? Because we should be very skeptical, especially in complex uh, scenarios, what some academic is predicting or even even some class of experts. So in, in global warming, climate change, it's really a class of experts and they all have very similar incentives. They all have the incentive to, uh, oh yeah, Bill McKim is exaggerating that, but we won't stop him from doing that. It's it's really good if people are scared of, you know, climate catastrophe in the future. You know, we think climate change catastrophe will happen, not in the way Bill McKibben portrays it or when he claims you can feel it right now. Maybe that's wrong. But yeah, it's overall, it's really good. It gives certainly uh, more money to climate change science or academia, whatever you want to call it. And so it will advance our political cause as well. So we have to be very aware that even when a majority of experts says something or agrees with something or has a certain narrative, we need to remain skeptical about things. So what, what are the incentives? What do we really know? Can they explain how they know things and with what degree of certainty they know things and so on? And this is just a little story to highlight that. So the, the Glacier National Park staff is admitting that their narrative about uh, the glaciers was absolutely bogus and nonsense. And uh, so they are at least doing it by action, sadly not by uh, words in the headlines. I think that a, a lot of what you're seeing here is, I mean, somebody needs to create a resource with every environmentalist prediction. And I mean, they should just play 24 seven and on a billboard in Times Square. Um, because I do think they're important and revealing and not just in a gotcha way. Um, but the revealing of just the nature of the movement. That is, this is not fundamentally a scientific movement. A scientific movement is you have a theory that generates predictions that are used to test your theory. And if your predictions don't work out, then you have to revisit your theory and think there's something wrong with it, then I'm getting wrong predictions. But if you contrast that with like, it's not just science that makes predictions, like every apocalyptic religion will say like, look, the end of the world is coming because we have sinned against God. And then when the apocalypse doesn't arrive, they just move the date forward, but they're, they're not changing their basic framework. And what's going on here is that you have a, in a, not a scientific uh, theory fundamentally, but you have an ideological framework. It's an ideological framework that says that, you know, the earth is stable, safe, it's suffi sufficient. And that the, 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 human sin is to have an impact on it to make a footprint and human virtue comes from just avoiding messing it up not making impacts and then the earth will take care of us but if we do continue to make footprints if we do continue to have an impact it will punish us and that's what's generating all of these doom and gloom predictions and uh it's also why those predictions have turned out in uh case after case to be false because that is the wrong model that is the wrong framework for actually thinking about um, human beings and the relationship to nature. It's that we ha we are improvers of nature, which is naturally unstable, unsafe, and deficient. And the the but what happens is that the culture at large shares the framework, including like genuine scientists who work on these issues. Even if you know it's that they share this fundamental framework, as does the media and does the public and it's your framework that causes you to find these kind of predictions plausible. Whereas if you take something that has a much better track record for predictions, which is the, the uh, of like, what is, you know, the next 20 years going to look like in terms of our demand for energy. And you have most reputable or every reputable um, organization 
saying that, look, we're just going to see an increasing demand for oil and gas for at least the next 20 years. And then they're hounded and uh, whatnot. But like that, it, traditionally, we have under predicted the growth of oil and gas, but that does not fit in the framework, the framework. And, and so therefore, those are regarded as uh, that those predictions don't resonate with people. And so you can't go from any one prediction to saying, well, every prediction that they make, including about climate is going to be false, but it's important to have in mind, like, what is their standing? Their standing is not as like honest scientists who are trying to get at the truth. The people making these apocalyptic predictions um, are ideologues who are using that, as you mentioned, in order to push action in favor of their agenda. And that is that means that they have a very, very high threshold or high burden of proof in order to be taken seriously. And part of overcoming that burden of proof is starting by admitting and apologizing for their false predictions.